So this week we are doing reliability, accuracy, and error. Three big words. Now these are things that come up in pretty much every single alternative to practical paper. And the thing is that it's really important to understand the difference between them so that when you're asked about one, you answer with reference to that one and you don't get them all confused. So we're going to start with running through what's reliability and accuracy. Then we're going to move on to error. And then depending on how fast we go, I've also got a wonderful complicated past paper for us to work through and actually start pulling these things out from. So, reliability and accuracy. Similar, but different. So if something is reliable, then we say that it is, it, it's consistently good. It's always, if your friend is reliable, then you can rely on them. If somebody is reliable about turning up on time, you know that next time they're gonna turn up on time. Okay, so you can trust something that is reliable. How are we going to apply that into biology? Well, if something is reliable, we can trust it. So if an experiment is reliable, we can trust that experiment. It's giving us good results. Okay. If we can compare this to accurate. What does accurate mean? Accurate means on the point, on the spot. There we got it. It's precise. Okay, so it is Correct in all details. On the spot, precise. So it gave us the exactly right result. But did it? It gave us an exact result. Was it the right result? So that's where we need to look at this, I think, a little bit of a visual workout because it makes life a little bit easier. So let's say we've got three targets. Oh, hold on, it's overlapping and I can't see. There we go. Okay. And each of these targets has a bullseye. X marks the spot in this case. Let's see what happens. We're going to have three different situations. Here's one of them. Here's another one. And here is another one. Okay, now we want to look at which of these are reliable and which are accurate. So we have reliable and accurate. Just have a think while I write these, what is actually each one showing? So the thing is that reliable means we are consistently good, able to trust it, okay? It's gonna do the same thing over and over again. So this first one is reliable, absolutely, because it's getting the same point over and over and over again. The second one, we are all over the show, definitely not reliable. And the third one, yeah, we very, all the same thing over and over again. Every time you measure with this ruler, you get the same. Every time you measure with this syringe, you get the same. Every time you aim at this point, you get the same. So we are reliable. Are we accurate? In the first one, no, we're not. Yes, we got the same thing over and over again, but it wasn't in the right place. So not accurate. In the second one, we all over the show. There's no accuracy involved at all. And the last one, not only did we get the same thing over and over again, we were reliable, but it's all on exactly the point where it should be. So it is accurate. So this is the concept that we're dealing with when we talk about experiments being reliable and experiments being accurate. 
So the experiment has to give us the same thing over and over again. So trial one, trial two, trial three, trial four must all give similar results. Let's write this down. So reliable, each trial gives similar results. So you've got to bear in mind, I mean, this is biology. Okay, so there's going to be some variation. This might be 52 seconds and that might be 54 seconds. But 52 and 54 are similar. If this is 52 seconds and that's 26 seconds, uh -uh, there's something going on. Our experiment is not reliable. When we talk about it being accurate, then we want to make sure that we are doing the best thing possible. So we don't want to be estimating somewhere on this tiny little scale or this enormous great big scale with huge gaps. We want to have the gaps that we want so that we can be accurate. So we need to have a well-designed experiment and equipment, well-chosen equipment is important for accuracy. Right, so things like using a colorometer for measuring color instead of looking with your eyes. Far more accurate to use a machine than to use your eyes. Okay, that would give us our accuracy. If we then did this measuring of color five times, now we've got reliable measuring of color. Okay, so they're slightly different but very closely related. Reliability and Accuracy. Have we got happy people? Shall we talk about error? Yay. Smiles, thumbs ups, and happy people. So let us have a short discussion about error. Well, a longer discussion, but what's it all about? Okay, so error is problems, it's mistakes. It's taking us away from that accuracy and away from reliability. And sometimes it happens. I mean, we don't all have fancy machines to measure color. We're looking at things, we're looking at test tubes with our own eyes and that, that is, so the, the, the thing that we're working within. So we're gonna have errors, uh, it happens in life. But the important thing is to remember that, okay, I have an error, but what is my error? Because if I know what my error is, then I can think about how that would affect my results and then I have a better understanding of what's going on. I can give a more accurate interpretation and I know the, the bounds within which I'm working. So there are two sources of error. Your first source is in, it's difficult sometimes, okay? As I said, you can't measure color. Is this red brown or brick red brown or brown or charcoal? I don't know, I mean, it's like, it's a color. My red is different to your red. So we have difficulty in taking measurements. Also, let's say we don't have a fancy thermostatically controlled water bath. Let's say we're using a beaker. That's the way it is. We don't have money to buy the fancy water bath. We still could do the experiment with our beaker, but we've got to bear in mind that that's a problem because we're not controlling temperature so well. So our other source of error is difficulty in controlling variables. So, a reminder, a brief digression, when we're talking about the different types of variables, when we're talking about taking measurements, we are talking here about the dependent variable. 
when we're talking about controlling variables, we are talking about the independent variable. So the one we are changing in order to create our experiment. And we're also talking about controlled variables. Because there are other things that we have to make sure that they are set so that we can measure our independent variable. So we've got three types of variables here that we're keeping an eye on. The dependent, the one we're measuring, the independent, the one we're changing, and the controlled, the ones we're keeping the same. So a reminder in the live lessons, you have the questions come through on the chat. So if you have a question that you want answered, then please just pop it into the chat so that I can see what the query is, and then we'll address them either as we go or at the end of a section or at the end of a lesson, depending on timing. Okay, so we're happy now with two sources of error, because we're going to look at each one of these in a bit more detail. Okay, we have happy people. So let's look first at this error in taking measurements when it's difficult. What do we do? How do we do this? Okay, so difficulty in measuring dependent variable with proper Fs. Okay, so this is all about the quality of your results. If you have a dependent variable that is really easy and simple and straightforward to measure, then you have high quality results. If your dependent variable is a little bit more difficult, then the more difficult it gets, the less of the quality of results that you have. So how would you fix that? You would repeat, you get reliability, you do multiple trials. So you see how these things are all coming together. Okay, so what are some common difficulties that crop up and how do we fix them? Because this, of course, is the question that you're facing in your exam. For example, we can be asked to do simultaneous measurements. Test tube A has this and test tube B has this and test tube C has that and then we add something and then we start timing and oh my word. We only have two hands, ladies and gentlemen. We can only do usually one thing at a time, sometimes two things if we're lucky. Okay, so when we have simultaneous measurements, we have a problem. How do you combat that? So you measure separately. Do the test for test tube A, finish. Do the test for test tube B, finish. Do the test for test tube C, finish. Okay, do them separately. Color change, I've mentioned this a few times now. Even color intensity. If you and I were both to take a set of paints and draw a light, medium, and dark blue, goodness gracious, I can't imagine that they, we would all come out with exactly the same. So how do we measure color intensity? If we're looking for a color change, when does the color change? Does it start? Is it in the middle? Is it at the end? It's difficult, okay? And that, that's a real life situation when you get into the lab, it's difficult. So things that you could use, you could use a color chart. So we get one set of paint strips. And when all of yours matches my colors, then we sort it. Then we know we have more reliable results. Okay? Or on a fancier one, we could use a colorimeter. Now, this is a super fancy machine that actually measures the, the color precisely and accurately. So go Google it if you want to have a look at more details. Suffice it to say for now, this is like a pop shot way of looking at color and color change and color intensity. Okay, so you've now got a normal person's option and a fancy lab option. 
whenever you're talking about um, improvements to experiments, you can always refer to these fancy equipment that, that you wouldn't normally have in the lab because you're talking about improving. So it's important more that you, you've picked up what the source of the error is, what's the problem, and then how would you fix it? As long as it links in, then we're cool. Okay, so if you're measuring a meniscus, this has to be done at eye level. It's really important. If you're looking at how something's raised or lowered, you need to get down and you need to look up or down because you need to be measuring at that meniscus line. Time taken. If we are measuring the time taken for this to happen or that to happen, how do we know when it started? How do we know when it ended? So the start and the end points must be specifically de um, described. So what I suggest you really do is to actually take this list and save it. And then as you work through any kind of alternative to practice question or even the practicals in your textbook, you add into this. Where was the problem? What was the, the difficulty that they had? How sort of when they were measuring X, then they had the problem of Y. How could it be solved? Then you create yourself this wonderful little collection of sources of error and solutions, because that's what's going to come up in the questions at the end of the day. What is the potential error? What is the source of the error in step five? Where is there a source of error in measuring your dependent variable? Where could there be an error with your results? So if you've got this idea of sort of things to look for and the sort of things that come up, then you've got a much better confidence in yourself when you're going in and actually looking for these problems. Okay, so these are all related to the quality of your results. Can you trust your results? Can you trust your readings? That is one of our major sources of error. So, what is our other source of error? Remember, it's not about measuring the dependent variable, it's about that control. So this is difficulty in controlling independent and or the controlled variables. So let's just a little in the note here. Our controlled variables must be kept constant and our independent must be at our predetermined levels. We want to test the effect of temperature. So we want a temperature of 10, 20, 30, and 40 degrees, and it must stay there. So it's an independent variable, but it's under control. If we want to test the effect of temperature on enzymes, we must keep pH constant. So the controlled variable pH must be kept constant. The independent must be at its predetermined levels. So what's this all about? This is about two things. Okay, I say this is about the quality of your experimental setup. It's also about maintaining that constancy throughout your experiment. So it's not just 
the piece of equipment you choose at the beginning. It's maintaining it throughout. So it might look good at the beginning, but five minutes later, we've got a problem. Then it's not so good. Because now it's a difficulty in controlling throughout. Right, so what sort of things are we looking at here? Okay, we said we have to be accurate. So that's for example, we're cutting something. Okay, let's say we're cutting cubes of potatoes. Then those cubes of potatoes must be precise. We can't just say cut cubes, they have to be one centimeter cubes, or five millimeter cubes, or five by one centimeter rectangular cubes of potatoes. However you're going to cut it, that measurement must be precise. You can't just cut it in half. You actually have to measure, am I halfway? Not judging with your eyes, because eyes can be a bit deceiving when you're trying to cut things in half. Okay, I'm sure you know that if you've ever tried to share a piece of cake with somebody. Who got the bigger half? Okay, when it comes to biology, we can't have who got the bigger half. We have to have precise. So we're going to have to measure precisely. Okay, so that was about length. Now let's talk about volume. The volume measured, and this is one that often comes up. Okay, in order to measure volume, then you've got to be able to measure precisely. You've got to choose the right equipment for your experiment. So, for example, let's measure precisely again. Use a syringe for small volumes. So, two centimeters cubed, three centimeters cubed, five, 10 centimeters cubed, all of those we want to use a syringe to measure. We never want to use a dropper because a dropper is not accurate. If it's not accurate, it's introducing a source of error. The error is you're not being good quality of experimental setup. You have a problem with controlling your variables. Two drops here is not the same size as two drops there. So rather say have two centimeters cubed or five centimeters cubed. Then you know exactly, and you're using a syringe to measure it. Okay, another one that comes up, they like to say, shake gently. Now, I have no doubt that your shake gently and my shake gently look quite different. And your shake gently next to the next person's shake gently is going to be different again. So how can that be consistent? How can we have something that's the same from your experiment to my experiment? It's not going to happen, okay? Shaking is dodgy. So you have these fancy, fancy machines where you can put your test tubes in, they're all lined up, and then the machine goes and shakes them all together, okay? So that is an automatic stirrer. Also, you can put them in, and they all get a little rod, and they all get stirred exactly the same. But what we generally stick to at the level that you guys are working with and moving forward to AS biology is to stir with a glass rod. Always a glass rod because you don't want it reacting with whatever is in your test tube. Okay, so when you're stirring with a glass rod, then you're getting the same amount of stirring. As long as you make sure you clean that rod between test tubes. Okay, then another one. We need to be able to maintain temperature. Okay, it might start out at 10, 20, 30, 40 degrees, but does it stay at 10, 20, 30, 40 degrees for the duration of the experiment? And that is often something that goes a bit wonky. So the big one here that you want to be aware of and you need to be able to use is the term of oh, thermostatically controlled water bath. So that's a water bath with a thermostat. You set it at a specific temperature 
and it keeps everything at that temperature for as long as you leave it there. Okay, so then you know that throughout your experiment, that temperature stays the same. So if you're testing the effect of pH on enzymes, you can have different pHs, but you have the same temperature. So you can control that variable. You could have multiple different thermostatically controlled water baths, then you know you can test the effect of temperature. Okay, so you've got two sources of error. Error is very closely linked into accuracy and reliability. They all sort of work together. So make sure that you take the time to sort yourself out on all of these concepts so that you're happy moving forward and pulling this out of the press. And what we'll do now, obviously it's taken me half an hour to get through all of this, so in two weeks' time, we're going to go through that paper that I found, which is such a nice tying together of all of this. And we will have a look at where we find all of this within that paper. Okay.